So we're very excited to be welcoming Tommy Orange. He's a graduate of the MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts. He's an enrolled member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. And most of us know him for his first book, There There, which was a finalist for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize and received the 2019 American Book Award. And his new book, Wandering Stars, sees the author return to these characters to ex excavate American ills and its continuing war it's on, on its own people in beautiful prose. I mean, I like that. Orange will be in conversation with Kave Akbar. His poems appear in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Paris Review, Best American Poetry, and elsewhere. And he is the author of two poetry collections, Pilgrim Bell and Calling a Wolf a Wolf, as well as his excellent debut novel, Marta, which was released earlier this year. So please join me in welcoming Tommy Orange and Kave Akbar. It has been said that you know the life you're being born into, that you heard the story told to you before you came, and that as your life happens to you, as all the many people and dreams and events unfold before you, you will feel a certain kind of way about all of it that you won't necessarily recognize as remembering the story. Most lives begin and end with great pain. Your birth will mean your mother's death. Look. Even now, your bloody body is coming out and up by hands you will become familiar with, will become family with, that do not belong to your mother. Growing up, you will not know anything about your mother. Your name will be Vicky. You will hate to have to answer to that, that sound like a little whip, like a thin little thwap, like a stick scraping a window, or like that sick sucking sound you will hear when you get your first hickey from an Indian boy in an alley, which you will hide at work with a scarf borrowed from Jackie, one of the other young Indian women you will work with at the jean factory. Walk up to her after work there in front of the factory. Even though you feel shy, say hi and ask her what she's doing. Listen to how she asks, do you mean now? Tell her you do. Enter the bar she's clearly been to before. Drink as much as she drinks. Further fall for this woman you know likes you and has something to teach you, even though you can't remember on the walk home anything you said to each other. Go to Jackie when you think you need help and go to her when you don't think you need help, but don't get her involved with the men in your life. Protect her from them. Because there will be other marks from not boys but men that will not be hidden so easily as a hickey, nor will these marks be made with mouths. Leave those men. Find ways to get back at them. Leak the air from their tires. Call them in the middle of the night. Let their dogs out of their yards. Drop frozen fish in the open windows of their cars. Call out their names on the street, then hide. These men who hurt you, who wrong you, who hit you, make them miserable in every way you can. Some would call it spite. For women, it will be called spite and being vindictive while injured men receive their justice and pass out their vengeance. Women will be called petty and catty, won't get to feel the honor in word, honor a word like revenge endows upon men. You will. Inside, you will declare it. You will declare victory when you hurt them back and move on from them faster than a machine hems a gene. You run in a rhythm you find without even trying to in the middle of a long work day. Keep pursuing Jackie as a friend. Ask her questions about her life. Hear the way she tells you that she's from here, that her family is from here going all the way back. Listen to the way she says she is alone. The look on her face with all that concrete behind her, all the buildings and streets and cars rushing by. Think about what she means by way back. Don't ask her anything yet. Don't tell her about yourself. Listen. Jackie will come to mean more than family to you because the idea and feeling of family will be made a lie. Your white parents will not be your real parents, and you will find that, that out far too late. 
Finding out late will set you off searching everywhere for what it might mean that you are an Indian woman born of an Indian woman who died giving birth to you, then raised by white parents. Your full name will be Victoria. Your real mother will give you that name, will have said that to your white parents as they helped her through labor while also helping themselves to you, your mother's child, just as soon as the wet and life in her eyes was gone. They will keep the name Victoria for you, but only ever call you Vicky. That they keep anything that came from your mother will be a kind of miracle, as all Indians alive past the year 1900 are kinds of miracles. You will wonder about the name Victoria once you find out your real mother named you that while she was dying and birthing you. Wonder if she was saying the word victory out loud at some unknown triumph, perhaps the sound of you crying as you came out, that you came out alive, that she birthed a living being, brought another Indian into, into a country that had been doing its best to disappear you for hundreds of years in countless ways. Victory was a child in such a country. I love this moment, this character, this movement so much. And um, I, I started out as a poet. Um, my first two books were books of poetry. and. A thing that I'm always dazzled by in hearing your work aloud, and sometimes when you send me pages, I'll read them to myself out loud because I just find it so delicious, um, is just how much emotional data there is in the sonic topography of the language, you know? Just how much, like even if I didn't speak English, I would know the general sort of connotative content of what you just said. You know, I'd know the emotional content of what was just said. There's something musical about it. There's something about the pacing. Can you talk, I mean, you are also a musician, um, uh, a dazzlingly talented, kind of obnoxiously talented one, frankly. Uh, I feel like everyone should only get to be very good at one thing. Um, uh, but um, can you talk a little bit about the musicality, how music plays into the work that you do on the page? Um, it was, it's something that I've, I've only realized I was doing after the fact. Uh -huh. So like I wrote all of there there um, and I read out loud to listen to the sound of sentences as part of revision, like a vital part of revision. Um, the sound of sentences lets me know how far along it is in revision and will always reveal to me the the hardest truths about what I need to do to the sentence. And it can be painful to read early drafts that aren't good. Um, so I went to, my undergrad was in sound engineering. Um, I was a musician before I was a writer. And getting an education in sound, like, completely changed me as a person. Um, but I didn't, there was, I'm a pretty instinctual writer. Um, the first nine years of writing, I was just doing it completely on my own. Um, and, and this revision thing that I found out, like with this reading out loud thing, um, I just stumbled upon it. Yeah. And um, I've realized, you know, like I said, way late that it's this idea of what, what how should a sentence sound. And it's not just musical it, like it's I don't mean to um, reduce it to like my sentences are beautiful because they're musical or whatever like not even saying they're beautiful but I but I use this tool to, to think about the sentences and obviously I'm always thinking about story and pacing and readability and all these other things and that's sonically also where I'm getting the information it's, it, it's I'm not just listening for like does it sound right it's I'm listening for all these other things that have to do with rhythm and where's the reader and, and am I losing them? And, you know, if I'm reading it and I lose myself while I'm reading it out loud, that's an indication that something needs to change in the rhythm or be cut. Um, and uh, it helps having a brilliant editor who you're like, 
basically afraid to send stuff to, <laughs> um, but always agree with what she ends up telling you about where the work needs to get to. So, so Jordan is our editor, sort of hiding her face back there and blushing. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what you're working? Because she edited there, there too, and she saw that manuscript before it was ever, you know, the the billion copies sold bestseller that it became. Right? She saw that manuscript from its sort of early er draft. So, do you want to talk a little bit about what that editing process has been like with Jordan? Yeah, it's been um, it's been amazing, you know. Overall, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, and you have to trust somebody yeah. to tell you what's what's right for the story. Yeah. And so, you know, when it comes time to send something in, like I send to you, and you're like, you know, dear friend, and you say nice things, and we keep each other writing. Yeah. And that's like the goal or like Mario read a super early draft that was um, not good, but he like gave me good words to keep me going. Um, Jordan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Love watching her face in real time. As we're is like a legendary editor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't always agree with what she says is when, she, when I first read this stuff. Um, I'm like, I need to sit down for it. And I end up reading it probably 40 times. Yeah. And the first 20 times, I'm like, no, <laughs> this is not right. Um, but I always agree with her in the end. This is, And so sh what she brings is vision. And I can't always see. I'm like down here. Yeah scrambling and she can see uh, she she sees the reader in a very clear way and she sees the story and and focus and you know so um, it's been a great honor to work with her and I hope we have a long relationship together and uh, yeah I, I remember the first time I ever went to Jordan's office I it was like everyone looked at her like she, like she was like Anna Winter and Devil Wears Prada, you know what I mean? Like everyone, like and and like she had these. It's it's in the middle of Midtown, like on the seven thousandth floor, and uh, and uh, and you had all these books around your office that were like. Like you worked on Nelson Mandela's autobiography. What the fuck? You know, like, and you, and like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it, this is like, this is like the king mucky muck of publishing, right? And so, but then with us, it's like not Anna Winter, it's like Julia Childs meets Mr. Rogers. You know what I mean? Like, like, she like, she like takes such good care of us. And, and, and I think it like getting the full spectrum, I think really is, it's, it's so, it's such a scary thing to hand a not done piece of work to someone and say, tell me what to do, right? But your nose is pressed so up to the mural that it's hard to see the whole picture. Yeah. Um, we should explain really quickly. Um, so we met in 2019 and basically started writing our books together and um, ended up, he ended up with Knopf, which is where I already was, and with Jordan my editor, like totally by chance. And our books came out one month apart. And like the timing of books is super weird. Yeah. And they started you, out a lot further apart and then they yes. just kept like, like a magnet getting pulled closer and closer to each other. So we're like in the middle of a crazy moment of like our books came out super close and we're like writing this similar wave. Um, and with, you know, the same people. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like Tommy is one of my best friends on the planet earth. And so this is this, mo you know, we did an event in San Francisco for my book launch and then getting to be here for Tommy's is just like, it's beyond beyond for me. Just, this is, this is like one of the coolest things I'll ever get to do in my life to like have this journey of just trading these sloppy, messy pages and reading your book over and over again. And you know, this was, I wrote my first novel, you know, Tommy was writing the sequel to like, the greatest novel of the 20th century, you know, 21st century, um, you know, and, uh, and so it could feel like sometimes I was, you know, 
showing my macaroni art to Michelangelo a little bit, you know, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but it was good. I mean, like Tommy never made me feel like that. You know, Tommy would gas me up and, you know, uh, wave his pom poms and what did, you would call them cheer notes whenever you sent me, like we sent pages on Fridays and then you would like mail me back notes Monday or Tuesday and you would always call your file like Kava cheer notes, you know, and, uh, you know, it's just, so, I mean, do you wanna do you wanna do the secret special thing? Let's see the audience reaction when I when I tell them. Okay. So we trade. So we we started calling what we do like uh, being a band, because like musicians get to hang out and play music together, and writers are like so alone, and that's depressing. <laughs> um, so trading every Friday became a way to like have to create a space that's like band uh, band you know, practice. Band, a band, yeah. Band practice. So today is Friday, and we shared stuff today, and we thought we would share with you. Um, I'm just trying to gauge the feeling. <laughs> so, 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 like, do you guys want to hear a never before, never, <laughs> never, never before, never again, never before, never again, probably, you know? <laughs> um, and we thought we would read each other's if that's cute, because uh, just in the spirit of um, just my being in love with this man. Um, why don't, why don't you, they're here for you. Yeah, you go first. I love that Tommy's just scrolling up through our text chat from like this morning when I sent it to him and there's already like, like this entire span of scrolling has been <laughs> our text chat from like the last six hours. All right, this is called Love Poem with Bach and Envy. What stayed molten in me after the fire stayed molten for you, revolting for you. Satan winking in the work in the woodcut, mouthing drink up buttercup. He pointed at each angel saying, this one ignores me, this one restores me. But history clearly shows that what is holy is never merely so. Fate and cruelty and the house organ squealing Bach, kneeling vipers, baby talk. All our creditors now share a single crown. How lostness lives inside being found. Like an eye rolling into a face, fatherless, chaste. Your two fingers inside my mouth, my two hearts inside your heart. And the vile obviousness of ideas set down in a book. Envy, envy, envy. How Mecca appears wherever you look. All my poems. <laughs> um, I'm going to read Tommy's piece now uh, and try to do it justice. Picture an airship floating slow and low just above where the tallest buildings seem to touch the blue sky with no clouds. Picture a woman running through a crowded park looking up at the airship. It is reflective, reflecting the sky. Picture a man behind the woman also running. Notice he is chasing her. Notice this is not exercise in the park. The man looks vicious and the woman is losing speed. The space between them shrinking. They have left the park and we notice here for the first time the woman has a single braid of hair after her beanie falls off. The braid sways behind her but she doesn't notice losing the beanie. Her attention is on the airship. It is keeping her going. It is leading her somewhere. She has dreamed of this airship, but now the man is at her heels. She can hear him. There is his tireless breath. Hold him back. Believe she can outlast him. Imagine you are in the airship, seeing this whole city, the nation's capital. Now look at the sun. See the sun reflect in a bead of sweat coming down the running woman's face and falling and landing on the man's pants. He is right behind her now, but slowing. You, you are helping her now, even from your seats. Here you are as there you are. Here helping her by believing she can keep going despite being chased. 
being hounded by men for as long as she can remember. And look, now there are more men, old men, running after her, running impossibly fast. There are hundreds of them. It is night now. The airship is almost all moon now. And she sees children. She remembers she has been running to save the children from the men. She has forgotten why she was running. That's how long she has been running. She yells at them, tells them to run with her. She tells them it is a game that they must play to stay alive and she hears gunfire in the distance and knows it is coming from the men knows she needs to make sure the children run as fast as they can she needs to get them to safety but she doesn't know where safety is and she sees a building and someone is at the doorway waving her in and she makes sure the children get in first and once in the door it is barricaded and she sees an audience she walks quietly behind them there is someone reading something from the stage that sounds familiar to her, but there is no time. The men will break through the barricade. There is nowhere safe, but in running, but in moving, she finds a back door that leads to a parking lot, and the children are asking her why she is so scared, and where is her breath, and do they have to keep playing, and there is an airship made of moonlight coming down low and slow enough that they can get on and then get in there, is a, uh, and then get in. There is a ladder lowered and she is helping the children climb up the rope ladder and it is difficult and it swings and the airship is moving and here come the men they are screaming now their voice is low and monstrous and the gunfire is nearer and almost all of the children are on the rope ladder now some safely inside the airship from which she hears music listen you can almost hear it soft and inviting there is singing coming from inside the airship and harmonies but then to the dissonance of the firing bullet behind her, but what of you are you still willing her to believe, believing for her that she will survive, will outlast the chase and safely get inside the airship, which won't ever stop moving low and slow through the sky, believe for her that she will make it, and that inside the airship there is safety and the happiest shades of blue on the walls you could ever imagine. Blues so deep, blue you get inside them as you see them, almost like you're floating, like you've become the sky. Do this with her now. Close your eyes. You are all almost there together, inside the blue, inside the moon-soaked airship, ready to leave the horrors of hungry men who have forgotten how to keep the food, the riches they reap, who have forgotten everything but the chase and the scattering and disappearing of this world's most precious preciousness, all for what? For what? They have entirely forgotten. They have already eaten too much to ever stop swallowing us all hurry get inside the world inside this world so we can leave and remain and become more like the airship which reflects the world and keeps its preciousness safe inside the interior that way that the air feels different right now in the room than it did two minutes ago, like that physiological effect that you feel in your body is off some shit that Tommy wrote like a few hours ago. You know what I mean? That's insane to me. You know what I mean? Like that, that, yeah, that's insane to me. Um, I think that we're meant to turn it to the audience now. Um, cool. Yeah. I'm getting thumbs up from our, um, keepers. Uh, if you guys have, Questions for Tommy. Uh, this is a great opportunity to. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. First question. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, since you just read, or since you just read that, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it's like to write something I, that sounds like it was not just written as a first draft, but I would love to hear a little bit about the process because it's amazing. That's Thank my you. Rather inarticulate question. That is um, a little bit of a hard question to answer without Why are you like, so <laughs> 
without unintentionally, um, well, either tooting my own horn or getting woo-woo. And I don't want to do either of those things. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there are times when I work sentences for years and uh, it's painstaking and that has its own reward. And there are times when uh, it just drops in and there are, um, you know, things that when they drop in emotionally that I can feel them. And it's rare to feel your own writing emotionally. Um, so I know I'm doing something right if I can feel it emotionally. Um, you can't, like, teach how to write emotional writing and what's going to connect to a reader. And I hear people say, like, I feel so much emotion from what you... But I'm not, like, trying to infuse stuff with emotion. I try to create as many opportunities as I can to to allow whatever... You know, a lot of writers, I think, try to take too much credit for their writing. I think it's a collaboration with something deeper in you and something deeper in the world. Um, you know, if if we could, like, fully consciously control our output, then we would just dictate books into a recording machine and then it would type it out for you or whatever. But instead, we have to do this kind of crazy thing of just, like, your fingers are moving faster than your thoughts, faster than what you plan. And that is where the good stuff comes from, the thing that is most not you. So this thing came out today. Um, strangely, I was just telling Mario this, um, a, most of that piece, can, and this is also maybe a little embarrassing now that I'm about to say it, I literally wrote it running on a treadmill. Um, so sometimes pieces come out, and I send these all the time to him. Sometimes pieces come out while I'm running, and I can, like, I've learned how to, with my thumb, like, write while I'm actually running. <laughs> and that's a crazy and maybe embarrassing thing, like I just said. Um, so, yeah, this, this was, this, like, came out completely out of nowhere, um, and I don't know how to explain myself. <laughs> I'm so wowed by both of you. Um, what you just said, you were physically running while you wrote about running. No, 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 no. The, the physiological process of running while you were describing it, do you, do you think that that's part of calling whatever it is to the front? I mean, the, the feelings, the emotions, the experience? I don't know. I... I, it's not super common. I'm not like constantly writing and running. <laughs> but when it happens, it feels, you know, like it's flowing out in a way that like, I just, it's happening. So I'm going to do it. I'm not going to stop running. Um, I run all the time. And if I can do both, then I'm going to do both. Because, you know, if something's coming, you don't want to stop what you're doing. Um, so... I, yeah, it's not, I'm not going to sit here and say, like, I write books while I run all the time. This was like, you know, this is an isolated thing. Probably like every couple of months I'll send him something and be like, I wrote this on a run. More often than that. <laughs> it's not every day, but it's more often than every couple of months. Thank you both so much. Um, I think a lot of people try to write about addiction, and it doesn't always – it can be maudlin or, or sort of um, – uh, like we're um, observing someone in a moment that we, we almost shouldn't be. And I think you both write about addiction and recovery so beautifully and powerfully and realistically. Um, I'm curious maybe if you could both speak to the experience of writing about addiction and recovery and specifically, Tommy, if you could talk about why it was so important for you for addiction to be such an, a significant theme in this book in particular. Yeah, so we wrote these books together um, and both have, you know, significant relationships with what it means to be addicted 
to something and have friends and family. Um, you know, it's it's been a huge part of my life in, I would say, like 99 point nine percent negative ways <laughs> but the accumulative result the ability to write about it in a way that what I think we both hope is helpful because I think there's a lot of still there's a lot of stigma around it and there's a lack of compassion and there's minimalizing of like what does it mean is like a moral weakness or um there's there's a missing humanity about it and why why people end up in addiction. So wanting to do it in a novel feels like a really good way to to figure out humanizing it and to figure out how to if you put the reader in in the shoes of the character, this is a really good way to expand on something that normally is reduced in a way that's dehumanizing and and frankly boring. Yeah, I mean, it's not a secret that I'm in recovery. It's Googleable. I've been sober for ten and a half years. Uh, first of all, I thought you said uh, a benediction novel, and I was like, "Did I write a benediction?" No I was like sitting here trying to be like, um, uh, but I figured it out. Yeah, use context clues. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's just it's so much of my life, you know. And Tommy and I, you know, when we're not sitting in front of microphones talk about it a lot and it's just natural that what you obsess over and what you spend your days doing you know working with newcomers in recovery and checking in with old timers in recovery and stuff like this um is gonna come out of your pen you know charlie parker said if you don't live it it won't come out of your horn right and uh and so you know talking back and forth so much the the you know there's a line in tommy's book where um you say Oh, I'm going to fuck it up. The the stories bring you back better made. What is the line? Uh, I mean, that's essentially it. Stories do more than comfort. They take you away and bring you back better made. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is the idea, right? If you can think of narrative fiction as a sort of lifespan multiplier, right? Like you have a finite number of hours in your lifetime and you're tethered to your subjectivity, but you read Melville and you can understand what it's like to be a whaler in the, you know what I mean? You, you read, well, I know I, I sure, but, uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, and, and a lot of people have proximity to addiction without actually experiencing it and without actually really understanding the sort of psycho spiritual Genesis of it and understanding the just sort of like ugly, smelly juiciness of it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I think that there's this sort of abstract, like we support, Addiction, addiction and mental illness and then people expect the drunks in their lives to you know have three martini lunches and then go home and sleep it off without saying anything rhetorically unhygienic the entire time you know and maybe such a addict exists but i've never met them and i've met thousands you know um uh and i've never yeah so that's i don't want to talk too long this is his thing but yeah we have we have time for this one last question. Thanks for being here. Um, I um, listened to your book and read it at the same time, and I'm nerdily like I love old time radio. I think voice actors are really cool, um, and I. I, I, I found it really moving in both respects, and I hearing that you've studied sound engineering, I just wanted to know like how involved were you with that? What do you think of it? Um, just wanted to hear your take on it. Yeah, I love I love the audiobook. Um, so you re you read Wandering Stars as an audiobook? Yeah, yeah. So I love both as audiobooks, uh, and I I was luckily in in both situations. I was given like audition recordings and was able to, um, and even the second time I was even more sort of emboldened to be like, this is what I don't like. This is what I want. And, um, they're great at including native, um, actors to do the work. Um, so it was an amazing experience and, and I felt very involved and they're still fixing digital files. Cause there was a few mistakes that were, that felt crucial to me that maybe nobody else would notice. Um, but if you did notice it, anybody out there, they, there's a Cheyenne word. 
it was one of my, the first words I ever spoke when I was a baby is piva. And I would, as a baby, I would just go, va. Um, when I was like done eating, <laughs> it was, and it's like, it's good. I'm good. Um, and in the recording that currently exists that they're fixing, which luckily the digital files, it'll cure everybody's thing unless they're listening to a downloaded version. Um, the guy says piva, and it's just not the way to say the word. And then um, I'm not trying to call out my audio team because they did a fantastic job, um, but it did bother me. And there's a district that I grew up in called the Diamond District, and one of the characters says Dimmond District. And it just makes me feel like I'm, it's out of my control, but it makes me feel like it reflects poorly on the writer that I don't know what I'm writing about because the performance should reflect what the writer was doing. So probably no reason to explain all of that to you all. It's like a last, <laughs> a last thing to say. No, it's, it's an incredible audience. Like, it's like... Yeah. Entirely new text. It's like watching yeah. a stage production. Yeah, I highly recommend. And doing both. I do both, too. It's a nice way to do it. We actually have time for this one last one last question. Good, yeah, that was a good. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> I'll try to keep it short. Um, no, I mean I had a bunch of questions swirling around in my head to ask you, but I guess I, I mean I think I know you teach at IAIA. You probably don't have to teach, uh, but you probably do it because you feel an obligation to help other writers, native writers, to to find their gift and develop it as well. So I appreciate that very much. Um, I think as native people, sometimes we, right, we're raised to have obligations to our culture, to our elders, to our families, to our communities, and those kinds of things. I guess I was kind of wondering what keeps you humble in the midst of so much attention and love that people have for you in your writing? And I mean, I think that I was just curious how, you know, how you stay grounded and, and how you keep your family close to you as you're swimming. Yeah, I think um, I have a healthy dose of self-hatred <laughs> um, and, and self-doubt just like out the gate. I was born with some amount of that or it was passed on to me from my parents. Um, but, you know, I like on the first book tour, I took my wife and son on me for the whole book tour. And then we went to Europe together. And like every time I came back from an event, and no matter how outrageous the situation, like I'm with my family the whole time. Um, on this tour, this first leg of the tour that I'm on, my best friend since I was four is with me. And most of my friends um, that I still have, um, they're fr they loved me before the book. Um, my family is not necessarily full of readers. My friend group isn't either. Um, they don't. They don't treat me any differently. If anything, they kind of nag me or something like that. Um, so I think I have a, a support system um, that allows that I stay grounded. Um, running really helps, um, and and. You know, I don't even know what it would look like to all of a sudden be like super confident and like walking around with some kind of, I don't know, it would seem, it seems ridiculous to think of it. Uh, but I have a lot of people in my family that, uh, in my, in my friend group and, and to a large extent, I have a lot of made family who keep me grounded and, and love me for reasons that have nothing to do with what's going on here. So when I return to my life, outside of these surreal situations, like I'm answering 
a question from Deb Holland. Um, <laughs> like this one may actually push me over the edge. And I'm, I, may, I may go back home and start walking differently and my shoulders may like have like a different lift to them. Um, no, so, you know, I, I, I try to, um, I try to keep my life as it was before. Um, and that's, I think, the main thing. 